Okay, so I'm going to start with introductions now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this. Uh, <laughs> welcome to this brave new world of Zoom meetings and virtual <laughs> online readings. And of course, you all know that today is April 1st, and it's the beginning of Poetry Month at SOMOS and all over the United States. And lots and lots of poets are experimenting with this new technology of <coughs> doing, uh, readings online. So we're joining the club. I'm uh, Jan Smith, the executive director of SOMOS, and um, I'm going to be introducing I'm doing something a little bit different tonight. I'm going to be introducing all three of our performers at once so that I don't make an interruption in the middle between them. Um, and then I'm going to do like the rest of you and I'm going to mute myself so that there's no background noise. First, I wanted to just acknowledge how grateful I am and how appreciative I am of how brave uh, Kathy Strisick and Will Barnes and Benita Concha are for being willing to do this. It's such a generous offering to the poetry community. And I know we've all been uh, sort of at warp speed trying to get used to this new Zoom technology. So bear with us all as we go through uh, the reading and I'm sure it's gonna be a very enjoyable um, hour or so for all of us. Um, so I will um, unmute everyone at the end after everybody has finished reading. And I will also ask everybody to um, turn on their video at the end so that the poets and Ben can see all of your smiling, shiny faces who are here to support their reading. And you can actually talk to each other and it can be chaos. At that point, it can be total chaos. Uh, but not until then. We're, we're trying to keep some order here. So let me start by um, introducing our very own Taos Poet Laureate, Catherine Strisick, who you see on the screen. She's wearing a very beautiful, is that green? Is it kind of like a shade of green and, and white blouse? Yeah, with, yeah, kind of lavender flowers. And lavender flowers. Um, as many of you know, uh, Kathy is the poet laureate, the Taos Poet Laureate from 2020 through 22. And even with COVID-19, luckily uh, she was ahead of the curve and met with a lot of people already about her poetry and nature project. So she's already has the go, but is it five or six uh, venues at this point? I think five. I think five. I think five. But, venues, but yeah. some of them have multiple spots and locations. Yeah, I think I, right, enough for like 13 poems. 13 so poems. Yeah. So um, the submission process for May is still very much on. And that is just going to be through the month, of May, the month of May that people can submit a poem. And if you want to see what the guidelines are, uh, go to the... Uh, SOMOS website, site, uh, somostaos.org, and look under Taos Poet Laureate, and you'll find all the guidelines for how to submit your poem to be considered to be included in the Nature Poem Project um, in Taos. Because we originally had planned that probably the installations weren't going to happen until the fall anyway. And we have two years, so even if we have to wait until next spring, hopefully we're all going to have the all clear. Um, <laughs> so Kathy is the author of three published poetry collections, and I know she's also working on a fourth right now. Um, her first collection is titled Thousand Cricket Song. Her second is The Mistress. Her most recent chapbook is Insectum Gravitas. And you're also working on a fourth manuscript now, Kathy, right? I, I am. It's just about finished. Um, it's just about finished. Okay. It is. And yeah. does it have a working title? The working title is Ekaterina, which is ah. formal Catherine in, in Greek. In Greek. Yeah. Okay. 
Kathy is also the co-founding and consulting editor of the Taos Journal of International Poetry and Art. She was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, has been awarded many grants, residencies, and scholarships from places such as Vermont Studio Center, Lacos Crete Artist Residency. She's now actually a full-time artist in residence in her home, working <laughs> on her poems. <laughs> <laughs> Squaw Valley community of writers and um, so forth. And she's also had many of her uh, poems published in many different journals and magazines. She's lived in Taos for over 37 years. And um, her books, which she, when she, at some point during her reading, she'll lift up her books and show you the covers. But all of her books can be um, purchased on her website, which is www.kathystrisick.com. So I'm encouraging all of you tonight to, to support the poets and go to their websites. And, um, and when, when I talk about Will, you can order his book through his email address. So that's Kathy Strisick. She's gonna be reading first after Ben plays. So next I'd like to introduce ben, uh, Benito Concha, um, who is our musician, our talented musician from the evening. And he has performed throughout <laughs> North America and in many countries with his musical group called Secret Souls. His style of drumming has paired him with musicians from all walks of life. As a Taos Pueblo tribal member, he contributes many of his talents to his home and the surrounding community. Currently, Ben percussively incorporates grounded Taos Pueblo music instruments during a very special performance entitled Gourd Sound Healing. And he incorporates that in his treatment at Medicine Mountain Massage, which the massage part is on hiatus uh, for obvious reasons. However, uh, he's very generously offered <coughs> off uh, to give anyone who would like one a complimentary session of gourd sound healing. And he asked that I let people know about what his phone number is. It's 575-779-9800. Five, six. And I'll repeat that again at the end of our evening. And next, we have Will Barnes, who has lived in Santa Fe for the last 31 years with his wife and children. He's a writer, a botanist, a teacher, and currently works for New, Me New Mexico State Land Office as Deputy Director of Field Operations. Are you working from home now, Will, I'm imagining? Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Will. Or maybe I have to. <laughs> you are muted. There, there you go. Are you working you at home me? these Are you working at ho from home these days, Will? Yes, I am. You are. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Um, Will received his MFA in poetry from NYU. And um, his, I, I believe this is your quote, but correct me if I'm wrong. It says, writing over on top of an intro, his, intro history. A bar, oh no, it's from somebody else. You'll have to tell me yeah. who it's from. Barnes is a seeker and a tracker, a poet whose tracing gaze is poised to capture nature's plain speech in all its complexity. So who said that about you, Will? That's from Annie Guthrie, who's just a wonderful, wonderful poet. Um, she lives in Tucson and um, yeah, so that was really flattering. She's she not, is she related to Arlo? I don't think so, but I don't know. But she could claim to be, right? <laughs> no, why not? Um, so Will's published collection of poetry is entitled The Ledger Book. It's published by Three, a Taos Press in 2016. 
He's also published essays and poems in the Taos Journal of International Poetry and Art. And he's just completed his second manuscript of poems tentatively called The Country You Never Leave. Well, you know, how psychic was that? Now it's the home you never leave. Yeah. <laughs> Where is your <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Where is your manuscript at this point, Will? Are you still working on finishing it, or have you sent it off yet? I have not sent it off, but um, but it's really close. Um, yeah. Have you selected uh, publishers, or is that still in the uh, workings? Well, <laughs> um, Veronica and I are working on that, and so uh, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I, it needs to be right before I send it out. So. Yeah. Well, good. And is there a theme for that collection? I'll tell you when I get there. Yeah. Okay. All okay. right. We'll wait with bated breath. Um, and you can order Will's book, The Ledger Book, at WJ Barnes 44 at iCloud.com. Or it's also available on um, three Italian Press website as well. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. Okay, so um, just a, a couple of other quick announcements before we get to the reading, and that is, is that um, I just wanted to alert people that we are carrying on with Poetry Month, and all you have to do is either look at our weeklies, which you can join by just going to our website, somostaus.org, to get all the latest information about what's happening in Poetry Month and beyond. And you also can go to um, our homepage on the website and click on some other things that are happening during Poetry Month. One of them is a poetry and art collaboration where a number of poets have responded to a piece of visual art. And then in the reverse, a number of visual artists have responded by creating something in response to a poem. So the gallery is now up on our website and we'll probably put some of them on our weeklies next week as well and the next reading um, is going to be on saturday april 11th at 4 p.m with veronica golos and gary worth moody so also check out the website for the fact that uh, we're having an online book club uh, the book that's been chosen for this month is A Tale of Two Cities. Many of you may not have read that since high school, but um, we're gonna go into Dickens and next month we're gonna do a book by Isabel Allende. Um, so there'll be a Zoom meeting set up for those of you who'd like to read the book. The books are all available free on various in various places. And there's also a free online writing contest for poets, fiction writers, and nonfiction writers, and you can find out more details on the website. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ben. And I know he said that he needed just a few minutes to do a little bit of setup before he starts playing as a way to uh, introduce the tone of the evening.
<laughs> so am I being heard? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, that was beautiful, Ben. Thank you. And I'm really happy to be reading with um, Will Barnes and, and sharing the night with both he and Ben. So it's really lovely. Um, I'm going to thank Jan Smith Somos, who's been so supportive of me for um, over 30 years, and um, 
Ariana, who has worked so hard to set up another beautiful month of um, poetry. Um, I don't know how many years this is, maybe your fourth year, Ariana, but um, very appreciative. And, and this new way of presenting is kind of fun. I have to say, though, I got a little nervous. <laughs> You know, I'm used to like seeing people's faces and then I can kind of feel the audience. So this is a different thing. Just um, I'm looking actually the screen is of Ben's drums. Um, so that's OK. Um, and yes, like Jan said, I have um, three books. This is my first book, uh, Thousand Cricket Song, published in 2010. And then The Mistress came out in uh, 2016, and, and Insect and Gravitas just came out. It's, my, it's a chat book that just came out in uh, this past November, and you can get them uh, on my website. I have PayPal. So I was going to read from um, Insectum Gravitas. I was gonna use this night as my book launch, house book launch for this chat book but uh, I have changed my mind because I actually um, was supposed to leave for Greece uh, in two weeks from now and uh, with Ben and some friends meeting up with friends there I was going to see my family in northern Greece and so now I feel very sentimental I, I'm just going to read work tonight from that manuscript, A Katarina, and um, these are poems on ancestry, and uh, some of them, I don't know if any of the ones I'm reading tonight, but some of them in this uh, book are 15, 20 years old. Um, and then some of them were written three and a half years ago when I was in. Um, Heracli on at a at a artist retreat there, so that's what I'm gonna do. And some of the poems in this <clears throat> collection um, speak in a couple of different voices. This one has a line that has just um, another voice comes in just once. And I'm going to apologize. My throat has been scratchy for a few days with um, allergies. I wake in Heraklion with lady beetles. I am soft with healing after I am luxuriant with good fortune. After I am cloaked by lady beetles, a scent of salted olive. My nature, after all, means spacious, means rhododendron and a pretty mouth. If I give the impression of canopied with black spots after my sorrow, believe me when I say I am in pursuit of myself and a kiss, and might after I be a ridge on Mount Ida, might local wine growers and cicadas, might my hollow after deep between my thighs be my greeting embraced. There's a femininity, there's a femininity, a softening I'd forgotten. I cherish the softening. Holy is the body, its roundness, the flesh, its brine, a sweet secret at age 58, a shuddered body, a cherished resume. There's so much song even in heartache, and my heart, the female body, after bird melody, my simple request, after the seeded bread I'd bought at the base of Lazithi, flavored with orange rind. I am a Greek woman's body, I was told in the marketplace, after buying a potato and sea bream. The morning planes flew overhead celebrating St. Minas when two vendors said, you are one of us, you look like us, the earthy, polite, Greek, fluid. 
and the lady beetles they mean I am composed of a million single cries. <clears throat> This next poem is um, actually was um, recently accepted for publication um, by the Maynard. And so I'm really excited that's gonna be out in a couple of weeks. And um, it's a poem written after a poem of Lucy Brock Broido's. Humid weather. On Google, when you search, you will find me well-mannered with the linen handkerchief, the one I used to get away with dabbing. I strolled in Crete, sweating in the agora with iced fish and Greek men, some of whom leaned to touch me. Church bells rang. I did not count how many. I chose the companionship of the distant foreigner because he wrote tongue-tied and slept tied to me and remedied me to the flushed body and then to terracotta. In humid weather, I am raw to the primal. No white beans, no straw, no woman cycles, only the Ottoman house, the crazy owner singing, rising inside the high walls, missing stones of phylite, in the decrepit alley in the neighborhood of Lacos. This week, the humidity in the agora is so thick, no one sees me as real. On Google, on one of the links, you will read about me as a paramour on the flat rooftop in my fragrant garden, in tiger lily chiffon, my bared feet, my hymns, the evening star, nothing hidden. I sightsee for pleasure. Curious, does he? Is he warmed by the wind at the very moment I am warmed by the wind? Curious, is he damp somewhere in haze? So this next poem was written in response to beauty and bliss being interrupted. It's a poem that's in about 20 sections, but I'm not gonna read all 20 sections tonight. Um, and like I said, it was um, in response to something very pleasant suddenly being interrupted. Fisher. One. Katarina is my Greek name, and I say it only at church when receiving communion, or I write it now just to see the Greek Katarina. Though I wasn't born in Greece, and though my name day falls on November 25, St. Catherine Eloquent Mater, and though there was no way while walking alone, the Tiber, the sound from the man who leaned against the wall, roughing my attention away from Trastevere, my thoughts of Vatican and the homeless asleep, their dogs too tucked in. No, he didn't know my name, but he ruffled my attention, as if he'd called out Katerina, as if he'd enunciated each sound, k a t r e n a, as if he'd tongued my silk cerulean dress, Dawn's unfamiliar bird song, church bells, even my blistered toes, cobblestones, the corner market, its gold coffee, bouquets of peach tulips, and the young man with my idea of angel blue eyes who sliced unfamiliar for me to sample cheese, 
hard and salty. The saleswoman my age, her kiss on my cheeks the second time I return noticing her short fingernails in worn flats. She handed me velvet sapphire heels to match my new dress, she said. Sometimes the sound of my name in Greek is similar to the Christmas cactus in my dining room that blooms three times a year. That's how infrequently I hear Katerina said aloud. And sometimes when said aloud, it sounds a twist of the village wrist or Thea Georgia, my godmother, the sounds sacred or sprays from the Cretan Sea or a typical Greek day, which for no one else but me means love. So my attention toward its sound because it's sound k a t r i n na katerina 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 is love two the tiber with its gentle rush an exclamation or a grunt or a moan his face may be handsome may be crude his hands may be rapid my attention dropping his face, his hands, his unzipped pants, shaking his half erect out of the sound of my, my rough Greek, my Greek name is, my Greek name is, profanity that croons my half resilient throat, white lit from a street lamp, my echo, echo, echo of it. My Greek name is Katerina. My Greek name is never on Sunday. My Greek name is Sultana. My Greek name Hariklia. My Greek name Walnut Tree. My Greek name is Gardner. My Greek name is Crochet. My Greek name Zorba the Greek. My Greek name is Don't Fuck With Me, but sometimes the unexpected occurs and then the Greek Katerina hides in a vessel in Knossos or in a fissure in the green stone falling into the Atlantic off Cape Ann or maybe my blue silk dress doesn't show enough shadow enough of the body silhouette I have little use for the heartbeat of the world eloquent martyr as I stand opening my goddess dress on cliffs Six, where is the white horse wandering spring loose to the fence line? Seven, yes, my name is Katarina, the earliest bird song, 4 a.m., most from cottonwoods, the thin branches surrounding ponds. The creek flows from east to west, far from Trastevere, far from the Tiber, far from the man's concrete centuries, wrong, right, wrong, wrong, right, the creases and knobs of my skull numbed by the gravitation of late March, three days before Easter. I'm shiver. The horse pisses in the desolate field, the teepee wrecked by spring winds, no apple trees in Jenny's orchard, this view from my cabin window, failing while the weight of white butterflies fluttering low to the earth. I have not softened my belly long enough, the bed fluffed yet cold. For surely, my lover, if he knew I was crying, if I do not remove the dead soon, these vulnerable branches soon, their impact and fatigued fall. Eight. My village, Trabazitsa. My Greek name is the name of the village aunts, is the name of my grandfather's mother, is the name of the tobacco leaves, is the name of the gesture, the circular twist of the wrist recorded in DNA in each sunrise and leaf intelligence. I looked, nine, to the sound along the Tiber, the man's face, his hands that wandered the river's edge and all passers-by. The gynecological surgeon did not say 
when unexpectedly seeing the man's genitals along the Tiber, did not say I'd still be crying nine months after having my ovaries removed. 10. And no, it is good to cry with my face covered. 11. This will be the last spring. I watch the tulips blossom from my cabin's south-facing window. 14. Tonight, a fox, rust, and bushy tail darted across the highway, and as I was about to hit it, hit my brake, it's stopping momentarily, turning, then disappearing into darkness. Did I say yet that Jesus laid supine on the floor next to my childhood bed at Yaya's and Papu's, enlightened when all else was dark, that yes, he wore white robes, and yes, his face. I saw Jesus while a child, and he spoke, Katerina, 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 Katerina. Katerina, 15, say it. 16, high in the corner of the bedroom, Panagia, the red egg, the holy water, the oil. Did I say I may have been sacrificed in order to birth my daughter and her daughter and her daughter? So the last, this is the last poem I'm going to read. And this, I wrote an early draft of this poem quite a long time ago. And when my friend, Pammy, <laughs> and I know she's on here tonight. She's on here. She's in Maine um, with her husband. And she visited me the first time. And we cooked and we cleaned and we did what Greek girls do together. <laughs> we um, were, um, grew up, I would say together. Her family's home was across the street from my grandparents. And so we played together as, as um, children. And in this, and I still call her Pammy. <laughs> Her name is Pamela. Um, but this poem um, uses many words from the Greek. And, and I feel it's really important if you're comfortable um, using words from your native language, your native tongue, to put it in poetry. Um, I feel it gives texture and, and authenticity um, to a poem. With Panagia. So I, hold on a second. There's a, let me see what's going on before I read this poem. Oh. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of movement on my screen, so I'm wondering what's happening here. Anyway, let me start. With Panagia. We say Greek. We say church. We say Greek church. We say Greek school. We say Sunday school. We say the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say Byzantine Cross, 18 Carat. We say Baltimore Street. We say Haverhill, Massachusetts. We say Yaya and Papu. We say Greek Villages, Amagadalis, Travazitsa. We say Immigrant. We say Hellenic. We say Thalassemia. We say Greek dance in Boston. 
We say Greek Community Center, Ahepa. We say Greek boys. We say our grandmothers say, marry a Greek boy. We say feta, sumi, kazarola, venikia, domadias, stoma, thea, theo. We say yaya and papu. We say our grandmothers say, what, not marrying a Greek boy? We say, probably not. We say crocheted potholders. We say knitted slippers. We say embroidered tablecloths. We say kitchen, stove, and moussaka. We say Greek rolls. We say matriarchal, spanakopita. We say shrill and fast language. I speak broken Greek. She speaks fluent Greek. We say Greek gypsy, Greek Turk, communist Greek, island Greek, Greek mother, city Greek, village Greek. We say Greek Easter. We say grapevine. We say sacrifice. We say lamb. We say roasted lamb head on our best china. We say Greek friendship. We say when we go to Greece together. We say our grandmothers say, well, he'd better be a doctor then. We say prasa, the young ones because they are tender. We say mothers who dance on tables. We say teach your daughters right, we know. We say we remember them saying, do not forget us. Water the tulips at our graves in the Greek section. We sigh in Greek, sigh. We say sister, kata levinate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm seeing all these messages. Yeah. I see my. <laughs> wow. Hi, Nikhil. Kathy, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Well, let's see. So, staying on a kind of a Greek theme. Shall I start? Are we ready? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to see you because I'm actually reading off of my screen. So, I'm going to get a nice close-up look at my face. Um, I really I want to thank Jan so much and Ariana especially and Thomas and all of you for being here and the amazing community in Taos for all of your support all of these years of me and my work and I'm just I'm so grateful to see all of you there. Um, it's, it's an amazing honor and it's such an honor to to read with Ben and Kathy. I, I'm just it's really terrific. Um, I also want to thank Andrea Watson and Three at Taos Press for, for their constant support of me, um, and especially Veronica and Lisa Gett and um, all of you. So, so I'm just going to start. Um, I realize that I have a different working title than what I gave to Jan before. Um, and it's now, the working title is now Artemisia, a Bird in the Sweet Apple Tree. And, um, this is the story of a correspondence and so it has multiple it has two voices in it and so kathy has agreed to read the second voice with me which um is really brave of her uh to just jump in and um read someone else's poetry in the middle of a reading that she's never really read so um it's a story of artemis and Actaeon, and they meet and interesting things happen and then uh she leaves, um, bad things happen. And um, in the classic story, that's, that's kind of where it ends. Um, but in this story, there's kind of a transformation. And, um, and he realizes in the end that she never really left. Um, so this is 
a selection of poems from that work. And um, I want to say, uh, C.D. Wright says that um, the goal is not to make sense, but to make art of the story. And not to, make, not to make a story, but to experience the whole mess. So this is my attempt at experiencing the whole mess. Um, and all you need to know, I think, is that uh, in this first poem, um, that uh, in ancient Greek, there was no word really for green. And um, so that will make some sense in a minute. Originally, Artemis was ruler of the stars. At this point, she is all bird. The history of a color. You can see where the pathway bends into the hills, across the contour, rising, all the grass and seed, and thick between the ruts and where the road falls off. Cow fields, golden gate, the packed earth, hedgerows mark the water lines, the skies darken, piling into the north, everyone is calling. No single color in the chromatic range of green appears in Neolithic painting, and the Glaucus Sea is the same shade to Odysseus as Calypso's Glaucus eyes, as the Glaucus underside of the leaves in her orchard, as the shimmering honey she makes, a sweet paleness there, just as Chloros is to bright. Goethe says, darkness is not the absence of light, but rather another kind of light, like light, complementary, as mind is to heart. Color comes from holding hands, the warmth that rises in between. A pair of salamanders suspended in a lake, in the middle place, wavering between day and night. Columns of gold descend into the water, deep into the heart, still as a match. Then Viridus appears, and a whole family of names to mean the luminosity resident in things. Viridine, viridescence, verdance, verdure, verdant, rising from within, the way knowing feels before speaking can begin. At first I couldn't see. I couldn't tell between the mirror and the gaze, your fleeting eyes, the glance, your sunlit arms. It doesn't matter. You were here, a sudden fluency. Eyes closed, windows flung wide, and the wind so near and ready and the brilliant canopies of leaves and the sudden rain pouring straight down in. Ink. <clears throat> we began to write, he said. To each other, she said, each day, in journals that we showed so that we wrote in response to the letter we had just received on the letter itself, he said. We had two, she said, two at once, correspondences. What I loved best, he said, is the way you wrote over my words so that our sentences tangled. Sometimes, she said, we filled pages with ink till, till it was like a net or looking up into the trees. And each morning when we exchanged what we had written, I could feel you there. Inside the body of your words, he said, reaching out like a pathway lit from within, opening to a clearing you had made. For me, it was like falling in. It is said that reading requires the reader to acquire a self and that this selfness is an edge so that something lies between the world and our imagination of it, the way all language is a veil. But this was different. What we made was a place we could hold, he said, like the sill of a window open, she said, in a room that we painted, he said, side by side, in a garden on a hill, watching for the birds and for the weather that we made, she said. And so they begin to write together, to hatch. At first, it's something broken makes me look, a sharp, small flake, like a tear in the grass. And then it's the color, you look up. Nestlings. 
Sunday, near the beginning. I left my car in a ditch, tore my shirt on the fence, then slept in the grass, hidden till the moon rose and the sky turned violet, and the voices came out of the wind and pinned me to the ground. Tell me a story, they said. Monday. Once there was a girl named Sophia. She was normal in every way but for the arrow in her eye. Over time, the arrow grew and the world darkened. Of course, she could not see it because it was hers and because it slept in her eye. One day, in the way that revelation always happens, she caught a glimpse of herself sidelong in the milliner's shop window, and she saw the arrow like a wing with its mallard fletches nesting beautifully there in her eye. At first she felt shock, then shame, then a fear close to terror. And now, what is she to do? The world is a wonder, unfixed and unknown, the self in it too. What if she recognizes nothing? What if, what if bloodied and blinking she wakes herself blind? Having named the thing beside her that darkens, can it be removed? Once I found myself walking down the street, black afro, on the right, a city park with elms evenly spaced. On the left, a sidewalk, bright windows, dry goods, women's shoes. In front of me, there is a manhole missing its cover. I leap in and fall. At the bottom, I find myself sitting in a rich black earth. I see with my hands. I touch the roots. I smell the good dirt. Later, I climb out and find myself walking down the street, black asphalt like tarmac. On the right, a city park, green with elms and lawn. On the left, a sidewalk, windows, candles made of beeswax. In front of me, a hole. It is very dark and I can't see, but for the love of leaping, I leap in. At the bottom, I find myself sitting in a rich black earth. I see with my hands. It is moist and warm and I want it to fit. I want to taste. Later, I find myself walking down the city street. It is night. The city lights are like stars. There is a hole pulling me in. I leap. Circling, circling, dawn light. A bear on the path in my dreams. Late now, Tuesday, the mayflies rise at dusk from out of the rocks into the current, peeling themselves through the veils at the water's surfaces. Wednesday, something happens at the end of winter, a swirling time which, when spring threatens to wake us all, and the wind starts to blow its ruse and its danger. Come out if you dare. The darkness is leaving. I'm afraid I've lost everything. Once I went looking for the elk beneath the ridge in the flats by the creek, a young bull asleep in the grass. When he woke to my walking, he stood, and for a minute he stared, not moving. Thursday, once in a winter desert, hard rain deep. I am flooded and flooding, unraveled, Unleashed. Pine dropsy, mountain muley, june grass, sweet grass, wild manna grass. Suddenly he bursts into flight. Again and again, a madness of water, of heat. Friday morning, the windows open, binding us to it, eggshell blue, like that. Saturday, nested. Little wing, clouded. Rising. A hard rain deep. It was a gift, the night, the sky, the wind. It was a kiss. Like persimmon. Unfolding. So that's really, <laughs> it's really hard, Kathy. Good job. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but so what happens is they start writing together and they start going back and forth and it's much more, line by line, so it's much, it's a conversation. So this one's called Grace. Tell me where to begin. By the water. Sunlight falls through the leaves, brightens the gravel, 
There's moss on the rocks by the creek, a deep pool. You are my lost, found, wild child, eternally hatching. You are my mirror. I'm trying to see what kind of winged I am. Dragonfly, damselfly, flying fish. Yes, it's the form I question, the costume. Whether it's given or made. Or shockingly accidental. As chestnut stamens now strewn everywhere across the rocks, streamers in the water, a pendulous confetti. Sorrows peeling from the sky. And beautiful because the simple rain given to the wind. But no, shouldn't we say leaf wings soaring then? to land, because we want the falling to be flight. Comme elle tombe bien, everything's drawn in. A secret love. As water bends around the rocks again. It makes a kind of bridge. Step by step, my feet in sunlight now, how I would stay. To watch the hatch, the fading too. To see what we become. A wildness unbound. Chorus of waters. Spirals and falls and eddies and leaves. Speckled days that I can see only now. She is so much within. Like the fabric underneath until the veil lifted. Did she decide for me to see? She is herself most truly. And holds to her lines and sways at the edge as if to catch some thorn of thread. And sometimes flashes quick toward nothing I can see, and back again. Like a story, she is stitching something in. And if she disappears because I move too quick? Because you want to swim, alone, together. In the story of water, my dear, a thrill hums in everything. You, me, the mayfly's sticky wings. Subtext, a window in the green room, a garden of trees, the opal sky, fractals of gold and violet, both. Two salamanders suspended above the formless dark. Liquid speaking. November, it is late afternoon. The light wraps itself into everything it touches. The river bark, the templed lake, a language of eyes and shoulders and cadence and pitch. As the leaves fall, there's a music in the leaves, of bells, then a flock of tiny birds, or not a flock, maybe three, maybe two small voices moving tree to tree. Looking up, how like seamstresses they seem, making this, making that. Long lines, elemental, as if to wake each leaf. The story has a smoothish, sensical skin, a lettering. A body reflected. A note held, then still, as a picture of things. A window in, branch to branch, nodding air to shadow, making room. A kind, a kind of sound beingness. Can it stay? Can a word ever be itself, simple, pure? Or, so filled with naming, can we only ever hear the barest traces of ourselves? It's snowing again, this fragile agreement, the trees whiten. I wake to despair, turning inside out as if to follow the light till nothing is there, this place that was so filled with green. Once I was a bird. In sweet apple tree. Singing and singing for the leaves in the sky. When the winter comes, the apples fall. And the wind on the water calls and calls. So, I'm just going to keep going. Artemis, half revealed, caught up her dress and encircling shawl and sank with gliding limbs into the water until by little and little all her form was hidden. The branches that he parted to get a better view now grew in the place of eyes. And so she leaves and things go badly. And so in the next section, um, these are some of the, this is just a short snippet of the bad stuff because I don't feel like reading too much of that since we're all in quarantine right now. This is called The Mirrors. 
Each morning, the swifts return from underground to feed their raucousness, to calibrate the sky. And more and more, it's noon all day. It was barking, yes, a distant rumble as in falling rock, and then the pause. Look how the skin folds, downward, splotchy, burnt, like grease fire in the roof fields, escarpment scraped and breathless still. Who could be in there, furtive and scuffling? What in God's name could be in there, pining behind a sofa like that? Days and weeks, I can't find you, though it rains. We died in a moonlit sky. The rocks cut through my ribs, our bones like little boats balanced on the ground and the wind inside. We were told to wait for spring or something to melt, a color, a kind of rose. And then a dog appeared, stole my arm in his teeth. I could not move, I could not speak, till the seashells in my throat shook me awake and the dog leapt with my humorous racing downhill. You were your usual wraithful self, annoyed at my persistence, my endless decay, ghost-like twisting, you turned yourself to wend your way from out of me. I was cavernous then, face up into the rain, how lovely the blue of it felt on my head. My eyes open endlessly, my mouth a ruin, having eaten all there is. Postcard Artemisia. So this is at the end of that section. In the story, you were leaving again, but we were side by side, getting ready. You were dressed in blue, and we are shoulder to shoulder then, quiet. I've made you a card and filled it with color, but only the greens, the emeralds and moss and the ferns. That place, it shifts into wave, and we're both falling in. But here, the hills lean toward yellow, or shale and rust, as if all day were afternoon in a south-facing ravine. Still, the swallows are long-winged and strange. It's a kind of prayer, myrtle, teal, jade, and celadon, cerulean, or turquoise, malachite, then laurel, alder, chestnut, pine, willow, rush, nettle, dill, sweetgrass, sage. Still to this day, some evenings, I hear a voice calling me by name in the street, a somewhat husky voice. It drags a bit around certain syllables and I recognize it immediately. It's clear that there's nobody there, not only in the evenings, but during that sluggish part of those summer afternoons when you're no longer even sure what year it is. I often hear that voice in my dreams. That's from Patrick Modiano from um, the Cafe of Lost Youth. Beautiful, beautiful book. So this is the last one, and somehow she comes back. The trees, a correspondence. At night in the rain, the forest becomes a library. Once upon a time, long before. Yes, but there's a place I need to make, still. I wanted to live on Second Mesa, grow a garden. I thought it would be enough. A table, a painted chair. A blue square view of the sky, cottonwood in it. It's like a map of the country you never leave. Where the water rises out of the corners of rock and the ditch banks held together by roots. You can see where the weaving begins, willow bound. You feel such affinity for him. Yes, and yet he betrays her. It's like an invitation right here, where the road comes you out in the middle of no place and you walk towards something straight across the bare curve of it. In the wind and everything, look what they do to the sky, the vaulted arches, the secret rooms. And look what happens to possibility, the imagination of a life. All the places I have lived, the windows and the rain and the leaves, a stem from the slightest breeze becomes a limb, becomes a tree, something it never thought. And yet it stays here. Not on the mesa, but down below in the crevices of rock where the water comes. That choice. Thirst. Yes, I'm always leaning toward you.
Beautiful. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. My pleasure. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I just messed up. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> Look at all these things. I know there's like a million comments from people. <laughs> oh, Ben is playing again, so now, yeah. Thank you everybody that was very very beautiful and very very lovely thank you will thank you catherine it was a pleasure thank you ben well before i unmute all of you and invite you to put your videos on which we'll do in a minute i just wanted to to thank ben for that Board sound healing and 
the tone and the vibration. This started us into poetry and ended after the poetry. And I want to express my appreciation to Kathy and to Will. I have to say, I kind of like this sort of weird way that we have to do things now because it's giving me an absolutely singular focus on each of you individually and then together when you were reading back and forth. And it helps me to block out all other distractions, which is kind of like what we're all doing right now is we're going deep within. And um, whether it's about our Greekness or our ethnic background of whatever kind or the sort of exquisite observation of nature and relationships. It just it was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. So now I'm gonna unmute everybody and people can go ahead and you know, put their video on. Yay. 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 Oh, God. oh, hi, everybody. Let's Will. see who's popping up. Will. Hi, Gina. Will. Hi. Phenomenal. <laughs> and together, really. Yeah. Oh, it's put, your, put your video on. Kelly Mesh. Oh, you know, I hear Veronica's voice, but <laughs> hey, Joni. You know who it is. Oh. Hi, oh. Oh. Hi, oh. Hi, Pammy. Hi, Pammy. Yeah. Hi, Gina. David, he listened to. So then. Oh, David and Veronica. Hi, Ariana. Hi, Robert. Oh, I see. Hey, David. Hi, Grammy. Hey, David. Oh, she's going this way across. Hi, Nikhil. Hi, Grammy. Thank you for listening. Hi. Great right, reading, you guys. Benito, you look like you. Simple music, Benito. Yes. Wonderful, everyone. Yo. Yeah. <laughs>